thanks for joining us. And today we're going to talk about how to progress in Kriya Yoga. So we can think about one's ability to progress in Kriya Yoga in terms of three main factors. Body, breathing, and mind. And so in body, when we are not in a meditative state or we don't have any understanding about what meditation is, you'll have a body consciousness. We have this body consciousness. Our mind is moving around following whatever thoughts it has, distracting sensations, whatever, uh, mental reflections and so on. And that is not conducive to getting into meditation. And anyone who has no technique, who has been told just sit down and try and meditate, it's very hard. And then they get antsy and then they want to get up and end it. So the first thing that we address in Kriya Yoga is to bring the body into a state of quietude. So we want to be, make sure that we're sitting in a comfortable position. There are some folks that may prefer a particular type of rigorous traditional yoga posture, like Padmasana, the lotus pose, or Siddhasana, which is sort of a variation on that, or in sitting position. And the challenge with sitting in that way is it does create a stress on the lower body, which leads to restlessness because the body becomes uncomfortable because of pain. Usually the nerves are sending messages saying you need to shift around here because there's no, not a proper flow of blood. So really the remedy to get body comfortable to begin with is to ensure that you have a stable posture from which to meditate. This is called asana and this is what Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras talked about is to have a comfortable sitting position. And so that is why I recommend making sure that rather than a particular type of sitting posture that you have an understanding of what sort of fundamental principles you need to embody in your sitting position. For one thing, the spine should maintain a natural S curvature. Our spines are not a straight line. It is a natural S curvature. And to ensure a natural S curvature, we can look at a few key indicators. If the chest is bowed outwards it's, and the shoulders are pulled back, you are not in a natural S curvature. Because if, if I do this, if I pull my shoulders back like that, you can see that my neck starts to jut forward, right? I'm pulling my spine out of alignment. What I want to do is to bring my spine into a neutral alignment that allows everything to function most expediently within the S curve of my spine. So what I would naturally do is I drop my chest slightly. What that does is it puts a slight bow on my back, a very, very slight bow. You can see the result in my chin is that my chin is neither jutting forward nor is it sinking downwards. It's in a neutral alignment. As well, if I tilt my pelvis slightly forward, it also creates a more neutral spinal alignment. So in a sitting position, it's best to find a way where you can sit neutral like that. When you are about to sit down on a chair and your knees are bending, right at that crucial point before you get to the chair, your spine is in the perfect alignment. And so if you're able to sit with your knees below your hips, and then to sit down naturally so that you're sitting on your buttocks in a way that allows you to have a sort of erect spine, not pushing out your chest excessively and not bowing your back excessively, you find that sweet spot right in the middle. That is the position that you are most likely able to maintain without moving because you are using a minimum amount of muscle control to hold your spine in that alignment. It is neutral alignment and it feels effortless. So when I'm doing my meditation, I usually sit on one of those Buddhist kneeling stools. And the thing about that is it brings my knees below my hips. It brings me into a neutral alignment. I don't need any back support at all. And I'm sitting effortlessly erect. The spine is erect, but it's in alignment. And I might make very, very minor adjustments throughout a course of meditation sitting, so say an hour to two hours. So this might not seem like much, but it can make a world of difference because to get into deeper states of meditation, you need to be comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, you will never get there. 
and hence something that seems so mundane as a sitting position makes a world of difference in your meditative practice. Now, related to body, but also related to breathing in Kriya Yoga is the main practice that we do in Kriya Yoga, which is Kriya Pranayama. Kriya Pranayama is a form of intentional breathing. It's a slow, long breathing that has an effect on the body's central nervous system, in particular the parasympathetic. It leads to a lowering of our breath rate, a lowering of our heart rate, and also a lowering of our blood pressure. And what we start to experience when we do Kriya Yoga correctly is that we start to experience these feelings throughout the body, these signs of the freeze response, a bodily response to the parasympathetic nervous system becoming predominant. And what happens is the body starts to sort of disappear from our awareness. It no longer even becomes something that we are aware of when we're meditating. In a way, it's like transcending the body in meditation. We can only have that when we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system. Otherwise, we're feeling everything in our bodies as per usual. And in meditation, where you want to go is you want to get into an internalized state, and then you want to go beyond that. So you're going beyond bodily consciousness and you go into the deeper states like samadhi. Samadhi is where the body is no longer there. And one may have a variety of different experiences of this sort of complete absorption in a meditative experience, which is what most people in the Kriya Yoga community are really looking for, is that. And so to get there, you need to use Kriya Pranayama as a practice and bootstrap your way into those deeper meditative states. But people have learned Kriya Yoga from many different schools. The particular practices that I teach come from the Panchanan Bhattacharya lineage, and I'm an authorized Yogacharya within that lineage, and I give Kriya initiation to students. There are other types of Kriya Yoga schools from a variety of lineages that have different approaches and have different modifications to the original Kriya technique as taught by Lahiri Baba. Consequently, some of those practices are not as effective as the original, the ones that we teach through the Panchanan Bhattacharya lineage. And so there can be a number of mistakes, if you will, that have crept into certain Kriya Yoga schools that actually make it more difficult to get into a deep meditation and more difficult to progress in Kriya Yoga. One of the things that is not really a mistake in those practices, but an understanding or an oversight is the ability to do belly breathing. Well, belly breathing is diaphragmatic breathing. Because many of us in Western culture spend a lot of time talking, we learn to breathe with the upper chest and we don't so much engage the lower abdomen. And that makes sense because when you're talking, you're talking, talking, and then you breathe in and then you're talking more and more. So you're breathing with the upper chest. Makes sense for talking. However, when you are trying to get into an internalized state through Kriya Yoga or other mechanisms and you're using breath as a way to help to bring on that parasympathetic response, you need a form of intentional breathing, of slow intentional breathing that allows you to do a belly breath. Many people who have more predominantly do upper chest breathing when they're doing meditation or exercise or whatever, they have this tension in the solar plexus, which means that they can't relax their abdomen, which means that the thoracic diaphragm, which is what pushes up the lungs and pushes the air out of the lungs when breathing, and then which drops down to allow space in the lungs, is not functioning at its full capacity because there's tension in the solar plexus or abdomen. So the remedy to that is to begin to do belly breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing is easy. You just want to allow your abdomen to expand as you're inhaling. And when you're exhaling, you want to contract your abdomen. So you can do a simple exercise of when you're exhaling, pulling the navel in the direction of the spine, pulling it in. And when you're inhaling, allowing your abdomen to expand on all directions. What that does it allows the thoracic diaphragm to drop down and then more space to be in your lungs. And consequently, you can do a more fulsome, slow and continuous Kriya Yoga breath, which is what we call Kriya Pranayam. And so this might not seem like much, but it makes a world of difference. Because if you engage in belly breathing, you have more capacity to breathe and you don't create so much tension in your breath. That's really important in Kriya Yoga because 
doing slow, long, intentional breathing is good, but if you have tension in there, it's not good. It leads to substandard results. You will not be able to get into meditation as quickly as somebody who is doing their Kriya breath very relaxed. So that's what you want to do is to be very relaxed in your breath, right? So Kriya Pranayama, if you haven't been engaging the belly breath in your Kriya Pranayama, I urge you to consider it. Look at the ways that you're holding tension in your solar plexus, tension in your abdomen that is impacting your ability to breathe in a fulsome way. If you're able to relax that area, things are so much easier. You'll find the freeze response, the pratyahara, coming on much, much faster. You'll find yourself transitioning into deeper meditative states faster. It becomes more effortless, more enjoyable. It is really the natural way that Kriya Yoga should be done. So there's that. The other thing that some Kriya Yoga schools do is something called Shambhavi Mudra. Shambhavi Mudra is sometimes erroneously described as placing one's attention at the point between the eyebrows. And there are some Kriya Yoga schools that instruct their students to place their attention at the point between the eyebrows and to look at that point between the eyebrows, to concentrate at that point between the eyebrows. This is not a best practice. This will lead to substandard results. The reason is because you're trying to focus and concentrate and when you're focusing and concentrating in meditation, you are going against the natural flow of meditation, which is to effortlessly go into a deeper state. You are holding yourself back from progressing in meditation if you do Shambhavi Mudra in this way. So what do we teach at Modern Kriya? Well, the Shambhavi Mudra version that we teach is much more relaxed. It's much more spacious. It allows the engagement of the right side of the brain, the right hippocampus in particular, with spatial awareness. It leads to greater results in meditation. It leads one, or it supports one, to move into the immaterial states in meditation, which is where most people really want to go. They want to have an experience of samadhi, of infinite, vast space, for example. They want that. Well, if you focus at the point between the eyebrows and concentrate there, you're going to be slowing yourself down from getting into that state. So what do you do? Slightly upturn your eyes, engage your peripheral vision, and relax. It's that simple. If you maintain that sense of spaciousness, you may find things spontaneously happening in your meditation, and you're like, Whoa, it feels like a real meditation. I'm leaving the body behind. I'm going into the state of expansion. This feels good. That's what you want in meditation. So the other thing in Kriya Yoga that can help you progress in Kriya Yoga has to do with mind. What should happen in Kriya Yoga and in any meditation sort of progression is one sense of the body will start to become more immaterial. The body awareness starts to disappear right? The breath starts to become more subtle, which you get when doing Kriya Pranayam correctly. And after you finish doing your Kriya Pranayam, you relax and just allow your breath to swing like a pendulum to its natural position, and then it may just spontaneously start to get very quiet and peaceful. You get into a low idle state. The third thing that can happen if you're doing things correctly is that the mind can become more and more still. That is predicated by you having the proper attitude in meditation. And this really comes to the idea about concentration. Now, when people concentrate, they're used to doing pinpointed concentration. Just like the concentration that I've been talking about when certain schools use Shambhavi Mudra by concentrating a pinpointed focus at the point between the eyebrows, you don't want that. It's creating ruffles in your mind, tension in mind and body. What we want to do is have an open, spacious awareness. So the concentration that is used in meditation is not really concentration. It's more a general collectedness of mind around the object of meditation. It needs to have a spaciousness that allows one to perceive all the things that are coming up in meditation. Because to progress into higher states of meditation, you need to learn how to let things go. Which means distracting thoughts coming up in meditation. If they become a distraction, some people 
start to focus on them and hold on to them because they are adverse to them. They may become identified with them and that gets pulled away from their meditation object, right? It could be whatever object they have, it could be the breath or whatever, and it totally kiboshes their meditation and they're gone down the rabbit hole of that thought, right? That's identifying with the thought. As well, one, as a thought is coming up, one may feel aversion towards that thought, meaning, I don't like this, I want it to go away, and they try and push it away. What you're doing is adding more energy to that thought, and it becomes bigger. You do not want to do that. It will lead to substandard results in meditation. What do you want to do? You want to, as that distracting thought comes up, recognize that it's there, because what you're recognizing is that your mind has shifted away from the object of your meditation to this distraction. That's okay. Then you let go of the thought. Just let it go. There's a tension in body and mind that's connected to that, and you let it go. The thought is left there on its own without any attention. And then you return back to the object of your meditation. The best thing to do is to bring up a wholesome state of mind, which can be as simple as a smile and returning back to your meditative experience, right? So if you're experiencing sort of sensations in the body that are very enjoyable and so on, and that is the object of your meditation, when you do the smile after you've let the distraction go, then you can return back to that object of your meditation. And it is that simple. But the sense of collectedness of around your meditation object has to be porous and open and spacious enough to allow things to come up so you can let them go. If you are over concentrating in your meditation, what will happen is that you suppress things from coming up in your meditation that are already going to come. It is like taking a beach ball and putting it underneath the water. When you remove your hands, it's going to fly up into your face. So when you remove your concentration, it's going to come up with redoubled effort. This creates a problem because you have given more energy to that distraction. What you want to do is to be open enough that as things come up, because they are part of your thoughts, part of what is the stream of karma coming through your awareness, when you are able to allow the space for them to come up and to let them go, you're helping to dissolve some of that. You're letting go of those hindrances. It has an effect in your meditation. It will also, as a practice, can lead you into very deep states of meditation. And that's really what I see as a major impediment for many Kriya Yogis, is that they can get to a certain level of development and then they go no further. They're stuck. The reason they're stuck is because they're concentrating and they're holding on to their state of consciousness and they're not letting it go. They're not giving enough space around the object of meditation so that hindrances can come up and they can let them go. And then they start to progress spontaneously into deeper states. Suddenly you find yourself in vast, infinite space, for example, right? And it doesn't come from you trying to push it or concentrate. It comes from you letting go and allowing things to unfold naturally. And that's another thing about Kriya Yoga is that Lahiri Baba called it Sahaja Yoga, which means natural or original yoga. And so it should be happening naturally. If you're too concentrated, you're going to put a barrier between yourself and your ability to progress in meditation. So those are some aspects about how to progress in Kriya Yoga. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email at info at modernkriya.com. Also check our website at modernkriya.com and our YouTube channel. So thanks for joining us and we will see you next time.